Hi everyone! So today we're going to be talking all about how to care for what might be the most set it and forget it houseplant currently available on the market, and that is what is commonly referred to as the ZZ plant. Now scientifically this plant is referred to as a Zamiococcus zamifolia, but that is a bit of a mouthful, which is why we all just refer to them as ZZ plants. And I have brought my one that I own out today. He is, however, rather sizable, so hard to get on the screen fully here for you, but I will splice in some better footage so you can see just how big and beautiful this plant is. And this is what is known as a raven ZZ plant because of the dark color of the leaves. However, as you can see, when the new leaves come in, they do come in a much brighter shade of green. This is the newest one that had just started emerging last week before eventually fading off to this dark, darker color. Now, as far as varieties of ZZ plants go, the most common ones you're gonna see in the marketplace today are the raven variety I just showed you, the regular green variety, which I think sometimes is referred to as an emerald palm, if I recall correctly, and then the newest variety that we saw first kind of hit the market last summer, I believe it was, is the chameleon. And this one's leaves come in in kind of a variegated yellow look to them, but then over time it does fade to green. And even with your all green variety, those new offshoots that come in are typically gonna be a brighter green when they come in as well, and then fade to that more rich green over time. Oh, and before I forget, there is also a variety known as Zinzi, and this is actually a miniature variety of this plant. So it will stay a lot more compact than the other varieties that I've discussed so far. It typically will only get to, I believe about like 12 to 18 inches high and wide. So if you like the look of a ZZ plant, but you don't have space to have one that is gonna get as big as this one has gotten for me, then that Zin Z variety would be a good option for you. So ZZ plants are very succulent-like in nature, and part of the reason for that is because they are native to very dry grassland and forest areas in Eastern Africa. So they had to develop mechanisms to be able to store excess water for prolonged periods of drought. So let's talk about the growth pattern for these plants a little bit more next, since that kind of comes into play. So they are rhizome-based plants, and they do produce rather sizable tubers off of those rhizomes, and those tubers store excess water. In addition to that, the stems on this plant are rather thick as well, as I'm sure you can see here, so that they also can store additional water and nutrients for extended periods of time. Now, these plants, like I said, can get rather large-ish. They can get up to two to three feet high, and two to three feet wide, sometimes wider, but really how wide they get, sometimes it's gonna depend more on the amount of light you're giving them than anything else, because they will sprawl to stretch to reach the light, and when they sprawl, it's going to take up more space width-wise. If you guys hear crazy noises going on in the background, George and Theo are roughhousing, so just <laughs> try to ignore them, but at least they look like they're having fun. But in general, this is a pretty slow growing plant. I've had mine for about a year and a half and including this new branch that's coming in right now, it is only giving me a total of four new offshoots in that time frame. Now, obviously the conditions you have in your home, you may see quicker growth than that or slower growth than that, just primarily depending on the amount of light you're giving it, and we'll get to lighting here in a second. But I wanna talk about watering before that, because watering is so crucial with these plants. The number one killer of these plants is watering them too frequently. As I mentioned, they are from a very dry climate. They are extremely drought tolerant because they store all this water in these various structures of the plant, so they can go very, very long periods of time without water. Basically, these plants are designed, I say designed, like somebody actually designed them. Nobody actually designed them, but they have evolved, I guess I should say, to rely off their own water stores. So knowing when to water these plants can be a little bit tricky, but the first thing you need to know for sure is you need to let them dry completely out in between waterings. But as soon as that soil is dried completely out, you may find that you go a month past that, maybe two months past that, before you have to water again. And that is because really you don't need to water them until they've depleted their own personal stores of water. So let's talk about how you know if they've started to deplete their stores of water to the point that you need to water, because it can definitely be a little bit tricky, you guys, I'm not gonna lie on these plants, 
But my number one tip for people is that when you plant these plants up, if you have the ability to allow part of one of those tubers that I mentioned be visible at the top of the soil, like you can see on mine here, you can see a couple of the tubers. I think this is a very smart thing to do in order to know when you need to water these plants. So basically I keep an eye on these tubers. Sometimes they just naturally look a little bit wrinkled, but for the most part, most of them are gonna look pretty smooth. However, as the stores of water in those tubers start to deplete, they will start to wrinkle. And even if they are slightly wrinkling, like you saw one on my plant is, and I've recently watered this, I say recently, 17 days ago I watered this, but that's recent for this plant. So even though that one is slightly wrinkly, I would start to see it get more wrinkly as the stores were depleted. And if you give a little squeeze to those tubers, if the water stores are starting to get depleted, they will start to have a little bit more give to them in my experience. And that would be a very good indicator that it is time to water the plant. That is how I have handled mine for a year and a half and I have not had problems. Now, depending on the time of year and how much light it's getting, sometimes I have to water it more frequently than others. So for me, it is living in my living room where I'm sitting right now. It gets light from southern facing windows. So in the summertime, when the sun is tracking more north in the sky and I'm not getting direct sunlight coming through these windows, I go a really long time. I actually, the I said I just watered it 17 days ago. Prior to that, it was like three months before that was the last time I watered it. So I went like almost a full three months in between waterings on this plant. And as you can see, we are doing fine. I have not lost any foliage <laughs> on this plant due to natural causes or something wrong with a the plant. Theo did break off to pieces about this long off of the top tips of some of the smaller branches down at the base of the soil. I was not happy about it, but I mean, plant still looks okay. But my point is, even though I went that long without watering it, there were no ill effects on the plant. If I had watered it sooner than that, then I probably would have seen ill effects on the plant because it wasn't ready to be watered yet. Now, now that we're moving into fall and winter and the sun is starting to track more southerly in the sky and I'm starting to get direct rays coming in to my southern facing windows now, this plant is going to get more light during fall and winter than it does during spring and summer. So I might find that I will have to water it more frequently. I still feel like I usually go somewhere in the winter between like one and a half to two months between watering this plant. And honestly, you guys, an important thing to remember too is the size of your plant and the size of your pot is going to affect that. So when I say in these care guide videos, like, oh, I only watered this this often. If you have a ZZ plant, I mean, this is in like, I think a 10 inch pot, by the way. If you have one that is in a four inch pot, your plant is probably going, not probably, well, I mean, I guess say probably, I don't know your exact conditions in your house, but it is highly likely that your four inch plant is gonna to need to be watered more soon than my 10 inch plant because 10 inch plants typically are going to take a lot longer to dry out. I also know for a fact that this plant is not like crazy root bound in here yet or anything like that. So odds are you will find if you have a smaller plant, especially if it's one that's more root bound, that you will have to water it potentially more frequently than I am. But the most important thing to remember is don't worry about how much time I'm saying I take in between waterings look for the signs that I'm talking about, like feeling those tubers if you can. If you don't have tubers visible at the surface, if there aren't any high enough up for you to see, you can also, and actually this is, I didn't have a clear pot. You guys know I prefer clear pots. I did not have a clear pot for this one, so I can't even see through the pot. But if you have a clear pot that you can put yours in, that way maybe you'll be able to see some of the tubers that are down in the soil as well, so that you can kind of see if they look like they're starting to kind of lose firmness or shrivel a little bit from depleting their water stores. You can feel around on the stems of the plant too and just kind of give them a squeeze to see if they're still feeling as firm. Some people say you can look at the leaves, the leaves will start to wrinkle, but my problem is these leaves kind of have a slight wrinkle in my personal opinion to them to begin with. So I don't know how easy it's gonna be to kind of tell from that. And I mean, they're just super firm leaves to begin with, so it's not, I mean, it would take a lot for them to start to droop or anything like that. The only thing I will warn you about is that if you are testing how the stems feel and you're like, oh, they feel soft. The only problem with this is that overwatering can lead to soft stems. So just make sure you're checking everything in combination. So has the soil completely dried out? How long has it been since it completely dried out? 
now you're starting to feel soft stems. Well, in that case, yes, it probably is ready to be watered. But if you just watered like a week ago and the soil's not completely dried out and you're like, oh, the stem feels soft, it must need to be watered again, odds are you've actually already overwatered that plant. I know I said at the beginning of this video, this was a set it, forget it type plant, which probably made it sound like it's kind of easy. It actually is easy in the sense that it doesn't need you to fuss over it very often. But if you are prone to overwatering, you could find this one tricky. Just remember, it will take a lot, a lot, a lot of neglect. I remember reading a story somewhere that some people at a university somewhere had stuck one of these in a cabinet for eight months with no water, no light, no nothing. And when they opened the cabinet eight months later, it was not only still alive, but it was pushing out new growth. So pretty resilient plant. But let's talk about soil next because that's another crucial thing for plants like this that are prone to being overwatered and overwatering being the number one killer of plants like this. Soil is very key. So because this is a very drought tolerant plant, it's used to living in soils in its native environment that dry completely out for periods of time and it needs well draining soil for that reason. So mine is actually planted up, I think in, let me look. Okay, I did a combination of just store-bought cacti and succulent soil and my Jack's Gritty mix, which I use for just my true succulents. I did a combination of those to make sure it was gonna be light and airy enough and that has worked well for me. You could also just use a cacti and succulent, store-bought cacti and succulent soil as well. I'm sure it would do fine. Honestly, I would be hesitant to put this solely into my Jack's Gritty mix because I don't think, I don't feel like it has quite enough moisture retention for this plant to be able to refresh its stores before it dries out too much. So really the other thing you need to think about when you're watering these plants is you are just watering them so that they can refresh their stores, right? So that soil just needs to be wet long enough for them to suck up enough water to refill those tubers and refill their stems and leaves. And then they want it to dry out as soon as possible after that, basically. So that's why you need a very well draining soil type that is not going to stay wet for too long. But let's move on to lighting because I have said in many a care guide videos to you guys that there's no such thing as low light plants. They're low light tolerant, they'll tolerate it. They don't really like it and they'll only tolerate it for a while in some cases. This might be the one exception to that because like I said, they did that experiment where they put this plant in the cabinet for eight months with no light and it did fine. And honestly, you guys, this guy lives way, way, way far away from my Southern facing windows. It's not quite as far as the Monstera, but remember the Monstera also has the grow light, the Soltec grow light hanging above it to help it out. So I will measure it for you. I think it's probably like, 10, 12 feet away from the southern facing windows. So it doesn't even get any like direct light rays. And it is done, like I said, fine. Now you can see it kind of is sprawling a little bit. So these branches over here are stretching for that light a little bit. If you want your branches to stay more compact and have more leaves all the way down, like you see on some of the older branches in here from when I, that were there when I first bought it, then you definitely are gonna need to get it more light. But I kind of like a little bit of this shape to it. It kind of makes it very kind of sculptural looking, but it has done, like I said, fine being that far from the window. Now, will it do fine closer to the window? Yes. These plants also are very tolerant of higher levels of light. Just be a little bit cautious as usual. If you're going to get them into a super bright location where they might get direct light, you might start to see the plant kind of the color of the plant fading a little bit and becoming pale. That would be a good indicator that it's a little bit too much light. But in general, they do really well in a broad range of light spectrums. And the darker leafed the plant is, so if you have the raven variety, the better it's gonna do in a lower light situation versus, for example, the chameleon variety that has that variegated yellow leaves that come in. That one is probably going to want a little bit more bright of a situation, especially if you want those leaves still coming in looking like as cool as they do. And don't forget that the more light you're giving the plant, the more quickly it should be using up its water reserves. So if you do have it in a low light situation and you move it into a brighter situation, keep in mind that you are probably going to find that you need to water it more soon in between waterings than you were before. 
But let's move on to temperature and humidity for these plants. So temperature range, ideally, you're looking at 65 to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Always wanna make sure we don't have the cold AC drafts or heat drafts blowing onto the plant. If you do have it directly in a window, be mindful of how hot around that window gets during the summer or how cold it gets in the winter because that may affect the plant. You may have to move it somewhere else during that time. Or for example, I have some plants, you guys, in the winter at night, I move them out of the window because the window, particular window in question, gets really cold overnight. It's fine during the day, but if I leave them there overnight, it's gonna cause issues. So I just move them to a table further in the room when I go to bed and then I move them back to the window when I wake up. Sometimes that is what you have to do with plants. But in general, I also find that this plant tends to, I feel like grow a little bit more quickly when it's warm probably just because of its native environment, it's used to that dry, warm climate. And some plants are heavily affected by temperature in terms of growth rates. So that is something to keep in mind. Now, as for humidity, these plants don't need crazy high humidity because once again, they come from an environment that is rather hot and dry. So anywhere between like 40 to 50% would probably be ideal for these. Once again, in the winter time in my house, sometimes I get down into the 30% humidity and this plant's done fine. It's done fine. You don't need to throw a humid humidifier by it or anything like that. It really, really does okay with pretty much most levels of humidity. Now I would be a little bit hesitant if you have really high levels of humidity with this plant that it's not getting too wet, too, long on its leaves because that will start to kind of cause issues on this plant. If you do find that is happening, if you have, or if you live somewhere with really high humidity, just create more airflow around the plant using some house fans or ceiling fans to help kind of keep that humidity moving around and off of the plant and not just sitting there on the leaves. Theo looks like he is about to do something very bad behind you guys. So give me one second. Okay, he thought better of what he was about to do, so I think we're good to go. So let's talk about fertilization for these plants next because this is gonna be a different fertilization situation than most of the plants that I have given you care guides for, and that is because of how succulent in nature this plant is. So in addition to storing water in those tubers and its stems and its leaves, it is storing nutrients that is collecting from the soil in there as well. So you do not need to fertilize these plants anywhere near as often as you do other house plants. I would venture to say, well, it's kind of hard to explain because it also depends on how frequently you're having to water it. So for example, I would say maybe once a quarter would be good for these plants. But if you are finding that you're only watering once a quarter, because like I said, I went almost three months in between waterings on this plant, I wouldn't wanna to fertilize today and then fertilize again the next time I water it if that's three months from now because then that's back-to-back -back fertilizations. I hope that makes sense. So if I say quarterly, I'm saying quarterly if you're having to water more than once a quarter. If you're having to water it once a quarter, then maybe just do it twice a year. Basically just don't fertilize it back-to-back in back-to-back watering. If you want at least one watering in between that doesn't have fertilizer in it. And the fertilizer that you're gonna wanna use, you want a balanced fertilizer that is like an NPK of 10, 10, 10 or 20, 20, 20. I personally use liquid fertilizer. That's why I keep saying watering with fertilizer. That's just what I use. If you have a different type of fertilizer that you wanna use and you have questions for me about if you should treat it differently, just comment down below. Honestly, the only fertilizers that I really have experience with are liquid ones and then the slow release granular ones, but I've done a lot of research on fertilizer. So if you're using something else, I can still help you out. So don't be afraid to comment down below with your questions. But now we're at the point in the video where we talk about pests, everybody's least favorite thing, but I have good news for you. These plants are really pest resistant. I have never, once again, knock on my wooden floors, had a pest problem on this plant. I. Honestly, I'm thinking back like videos when I first got this plant from other YouTubers and articles I read online and things about this plant. I feel like everybody said the same thing. Like they've never had a problem with pests on this plant. It's, once again, it's a really resilient plant, you guys. Mealybugs would probably have a field day with this plant because it does hold so much moisture in its leaves and its stems, but once again, just not highly prone to pests. Scale is another one that you might experience on the branches, stems of this plant. 
But in general, I, like I said, I have not had a problem. So if you are worried about pests and bringing pests in your house, and is this plant going to be like a magnet for something? Honestly, it's really not. Unless you have another plant around it that has some kind of bad infestation and it's touching it, I think you're gonna be pretty safe bringing this one into your home, but still always check for pests when you're purchasing your plants. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about repotting because that is another thing that can go seriously wrong with this plant and then you find your plant is not doing well and it's on the decline. So because this plant really wants to dry out, it wants to rely on its own water stores, it really needs to get severely, I mean severely, root bound and basically tubers trying to bust out of the pot before you're gonna want to repot it. Now, when I bought mine, I actually bought it because it was busting out of its pot at the store. I think I might have some footage because I think I included this in a plant haul video way back when I first got it. If I did, I will throw some footage in here for you so you can see, but it warped the pot. It was warping the pot. It was just roots and tubers. That's all it was. There was hardly any like soil left in that pot when I repotted it. That is what you want this plant to look like before you take it up to a bigger pot size. Now, typically you're just gonna wanna go one bigger pot size. I did go slightly bigger, just, I guess it's, I'll have to measure this pot and flash it up on screen for you guys. Cause I said it was a 10 inch, but I actually think it's an eight inch. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's an eight inch because it was a six inch plant when I bought it and it's still touching the edges. So yeah, I'm pretty sure this is an eight inch pot. So that'd be, that's equivalent. When we say one size larger, this is another confusing thing, you guys. I don't know why we say this, but I guess because we pot sizes typically go up not by one inch, they typically go up by two inches. So four inch, six inch, eight inch. So when we say one pot size larger, we mean two inches bigger, if that makes sense. So six inch to an eight inch. And once again, it has done fine. But I can tell you right now, I can see like roots on the bottom here. I'm gonna spill dirt if I try to hold it up to the camera. So I'll splice in some footage for you. But the roots are not like crazy in there. I can already tell like they're not going nuts. I can tell just by squeezing this plant that the tubers haven't expanded, more tubers haven't developed even remotely, like there's not a single one I can feel hitting the edge of the pot. So it's gonna be a while before this needs to be repotted again. Honestly, you guys are probably looking at once every two to three years to repot this, but also just keep in mind that it does depend on where you have your plant. If I had this one directly in my Southern facing windows, it would be growing more quickly. Therefore, I would need to repot it sooner than I'm going to need to where it actually lives so far away from the windows. Oh, and it's also worth mentioning though that if you do have a very small version of this plant that is in like say, I don't know, a three inch pot or something like that, small plants typically are going to become root bound more quickly in my experience than bigger plants when you pot them up. Like the bigger a pot you go into, I feel like the longer it takes them to become root bound. Has anybody else experienced that? If so, comment down below. So just keep in mind, the smaller the plant is, the sooner you might need to repot it regardless of where it's living in your house. But let's talk about how to propagate this plant next because there are multiple ways you can do it. However, few of them are gonna be extremely slow for you because as I stated at the beginning of this video, this is not a fast growing plant. And so some of these propagation methods that we use to propagate plants, if it's a slow growing plant, the propagation is gonna go slow as well. But the good news is if you want a fast option for propagating this plant, because it is a rhizome tuber based plant, you can propagate via division when you're repotting the plant and just separate out those roots and tubers that are attached to one of these growth points or multiple of these growth points, however you wanna split it up, just separate those out into their own plant, pot it up, and it's good to go. You just treat it like a regular plant at that point. But if we're trying to propagate in a way where we have to develop new root growth and new tuber growth on these plants, it's gonna take longer. Now, this is a bit more unique compared to some of the other plants, such as like Calathea and mostly just Calathea, that we say you have to propagate only via division because with the exception of what I showed you in my recent video where I propagated my Calathea warscowestii, typically if you just take a stem or a branch cutting, like if you were to cut here on a Calathea and stick it in the water, 
Typically, you're not going to get roots. If you do get roots, it might never actually develop fully into a rhizome and the associated tubers that we're used to seeing. But with this plant, it can happen. So you can cut like right below a leaf node, like I'm showing right here, and stick this into water and it will start to develop. Actually, typically it will start to develop a tuber first versus just a bunch of roots and then tubers, but it's going to take a long, long time. Now you can also take this straight into soil. However, what I have heard from people, and it makes sense to me because these are kind of thick stems. So also remember if you are going to propagate this way, let that end of the stem callus over, dry out and callus over before you put it into water to reduce the likelihood of rot. Same thing if you were going to try to put it in soil, you'd wanna let it callus over, but because it's such a thick stem and is more prone to easily rot during propagation. If you are wanting to go wanting to go direct into soil, I would actually recommend you to propagate via the last propagation method I wanna talk about, which is leaf cuttings. So you can actually cut these leaves off, put them into soil, even try them in water if you want, and they will turn into new plants. However, it is the longest process out of any of these three processes that I have described to you. I found a couple people who have tried it. I personally have not tried it. It took over a year. It took over a year. So I'm just saying division is the way I would go if you wanted to propagate this plant. But if you are a patient person or willing to wait over a year, you can definitely do it via the leaf cuttings. You do want to make sure that you cut as close to the actual stem as possible because you want that little end petiole piece at the end of the leaf you want that attached to the leaf because that's where that new root tuber growth is going to happen. So let me set this guy back aside. And the last thing that we need to talk about as usual is toxicity. And once again, unfortunately this plant is toxic. Now there have been some studies done that suggest that it is actually a bit more mild in terms of its toxicity compared to some other houseplants that I have told you are toxic. But regardless, it is toxic to animals and humans, all parts of the plant. So if you do have pets or a small child and you're worried that they're gonna get into this plant, try to put it somewhere out of their reach. If somebody does consume a small part of it or a large part of it, just get them to a doctor or a vet immediately and everything should be okay. But honestly, you guys, I can't say enough about this plant like or these plants in general. If we had an apocalypse, I feel like these plants would probably be the ones that survived when everything else perished because clearly if you can put it in a cabinet for eight months and not do anything to it and it's still alive and pushing out new growth eight months later, it might be able to survive just about anything. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this video today. If so, please be sure to click that like and or subscribe button down below and I look forward to seeing you guys again next time. Aloha.